Hey everyone, in this video, I want to talk about the disaster recovery options we have around Azure SQL database services, and that includes Azure SQL DB, Hyperscale, and Managed Instance. And additionally, what are those implications of the various applications that are utilizing those database services? Now, before we talk about disaster recovery, I wanna just quickly refresh on high availability because high availability and disaster recovery really differ based on the proximity of the various copies of the data we have, the influence, well, what's the method we can use to do that copy and what performance implication it may have. So if we think about high availability, what we're really focusing on, we're in a specific region. So let's say I'm in region A. And when we think about a region, we really define that as this two millisecond round trip latency envelope. And that two milliseconds is really important because within two milliseconds, it means that I can do synchronous replication for whatever copies there may be. Synchronous means I'm durably storing that operation, that data, to at least two copies before I acknowledge it to the requesting client, which means in planned and unplanned, because it's synchronous, I it's durably stored in at least two copies, I should never lose any data. So I'll always think about this idea of a recovery point objective of zero, zero data loss when I think of high availability solutions. Now there are different ways this high availability is achieved based on the service tier. And this is the same for both SQL database and SQL MI, managed instance. So we can start with the idea of general purpose. So if I think about the general purpose SKU service tier, and you may hear this called um, basic or standard, remember initially we always have this gateway. So the initial connection is always coming in and there are multiple of these gateways available. They form this kind of ring and that's the initial connection point. And then what we have is we have this primary compute. So we have the actual server that is hosting our database instance. Now what it is doing, all of the uh, data, the log files, it is durably storing these in standard blob. So this is Azure storage and it's in blob. Now the nature of Azure storage means there's always, if it was just LRS or ZRS, three copies of that data. And then what happens is, there's a whole bunch of spare capacity available so that if something happened to this instance, well, it would quickly go and pivot to one of these spare capacity options, which would then go and connect to the data and the logs, and hey, my service would be up and running again. So that's the general purpose queue. Now, moving on from that, we can then think about the business critical. So with the business critical, it's taking a very different model. Now we still have the same idea of those rings. So we still have the same gateways, multiple of those for that kind of resilience for the initial connection point. But now it follows a very different model. Yes, we still have that concept of the initial, the primary, but this time the data and the logs are local. It's on its local storage. What we then have is we have a secondary, which also has the data, the logs, and then hey, another secondary, which again would have its data and logs, and another secondary. So we have these servers here, which all have the local data and logs. 
So I make a change here from a client, it durably ensures, it synchronously sends it to at least one other, it acknowledges it, it's durably stored it, then it acknowledges back to the client. So you get that synchronous replication. Now obviously because the difference here is we actually have this always on, which is what this is actually based on. So we're using the SQL always on. If there is a failover, well it's just ready. So it's gonna fail over quicker than this scenario, whereas if there's a problem there, well one of these has to be picked to then go and mount. It's still gonna be very, very fast, but it's just not as fast as this business critical um, scenario. And then obviously we have hyperscale. So hyperscale is tuned to those scenarios where, hey, I need very high performance, very large amounts of data. And it does that by really separating out the compute from the storage and the serving of that. So once again, we have the idea of that primary. We would also then have our HA um, really um, secondary replica, so we have a HA replica. I can have optional read replicas, so I can have others if I want them. And what's now happening is, hey, this makes a change. This writes it to a log service, which then would send it to all the others. And then those logs also then get sent to a whole bunch of page servers. So we have a whole bunch of page servers that again are now using this remote storage. So once again, we're now in blob. And we would have n number of those. So three different um, service tiers. Now obviously Hyperscale is only Azure SQL database, but both the business critical and my general purpose well, that applies to Azure SQL Database and Azure SQL MI. And all of those have backup files going to Azure Storage as well. And as a customer, I can always simulate this. I can perform the failover. There's an AZ SQL Database failover command if I want to actually prompt and use that um, to make that failover happen. Now, if these HA mechanisms are actually leveraged, what does that mean for my recovery point and my recovery time objectives? And remember, when we talk about these numbers, what we're really focused on here, and it applies to all of them, recovery point is what point in time do I get back when I do that failover? So if it was zero, it means there's zero data loss. And that's what we're talking about. So in these HA scenarios for all of them, so it's all of these scenarios, so in the HA, which is within the region, we're talking about a recovery point objective of zero. So it's zero data loss. Planned or unplanned scenarios, we're gonna talk more about that, I don't lose any data because it's a synchronous replication, it's always durably stored at least twice. My recovery time objective, it varies, but it should be sub 60 seconds. This could happen because of a failure. This could happen as part of its patching process. But realize there is some interruption to the access to the database when it does these high availability. So I don't lose any data but the actual service availability, there will be a slight gap in that service availability as it does one of those failovers. Now that shouldn't impact your workload. You shouldn't have to do anything because for all of these scenarios, I'm just gonna draw it to this one, it doesn't really matter. But if we think the idea is, well, look, I've got my client over here. It probably isn't a PC, but I'm just gonna draw it as the client. What we always have to build into our client is the idea of retry logic. So, hey, if there is some transient error, the client should have built into it to retry the operation. And what we really want to do is it would create a fresh connection and then retry that operation. 
And I want to think about an exponential back off. What that means is I'm not just constantly retrying as quick as I can, because if you had all the clients doing that, generally it will make, if there is a real problem going on, it will make it worse. So we might think about, hey, it retries after five seconds, then it waits maybe 15 seconds for the next retry, then maybe 35 seconds, all the way up to 60, which is really gonna be the worst case scenario. And so that client retry, that would handle these scenarios where it's doing a fail over planned or unplanned, and it won't really interrupt in terms of the ongoing functionality of those client applications. And remember, there are maintenance windows. <clears throat> so for those patching scenarios, for example, I can absolutely pick the maintenance window to try and pick a time where it would have the least business impact, where I'd really like to try and avoid even that 60 second at worst case interruption to the various transactions. Now the default will try and pick an out of hours for the time zone, but realize your business may be different. What it considers out of hours may not be yours. So hey, you can absolutely tweak that. Now when we think of this high availability as well, I do wanna stress that I just drew the idea of a region but remember, most of the time what we actually have now is they have availability zones. And what you see in your subscription is this idea of an availability zone one, an availability zone two, and an availability zone three. And as part of your configuration, if you are in an AZ enabled region, you can choose to have a zone redundant solution. So if I was to take general purpose, hey, these gateways would be split over, the spare would be in another region. But what's really interesting, if you look at things like the business critical, if I turned on zone redundant, well, those three availability zones, let's imagine we have our AZ1, <coughs> AZ2 and AZ3, they would be distributed in the gateways as well. I didn't draw that very well, but you can imagine the gateway as well. So they're distributed over the zones. And the whole point is blast radius. So if I just say a regional deployment, they may end up in the same data center. With the availability zones, they are sets of data centers that have independent power, calling, networking, control plane. So if there was a problem at a data center level or even maybe a power substation level, it would only impact one of the availability zones. So the other two would still be fine. So I can now think, hey, even if there's a fairly major incident within a region, hey, tight data center disappears or is offline, whatever that is, well, if I'm using zone redundant options, I'm still protected. I'm still gonna be up and running within that 60 seconds and I've got zero data loss because remember my data has been durably stored across those availability zones when I use that zone redundant option. So if you are in a region and it does support availability zones, especially I think it's like zero date um, cost difference for things like business critical, et cetera, <clears throat> just make sure you turn that on because there's no downside and it's gonna increase your resiliency to any potential problem. Okay, so now I wanna start pivoting to that idea of disaster recovery, but before we do that, if this is, hang on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw a second region, so I'll have the idea of, hey, um, region two, or region B, I should be consistent. But before I even think about the region, there's one core concept when we think about Azure SQL services. And it obviously would apply the same way to on-premises as well, but the whole point is you have a certain structure to your resources. So what we have is we have a database server. So we have the SQL server is a resource. It's a logical resource, especially in Azure SQL database but MI has its own version. And then under that, I can create N number of SQL databases. It's gonna be database one, 
database two, database three, et cetera, et cetera. So I create n number of databases under the SQL Server. And I just wanna kind of stress that point because as we go and look at the solutions, let's quickly just jump over. Here I'm looking at a SQL Server. So this is that logical server. And then under the server is where I then have database. In this case, I only have one database, but I could absolutely go and add additional databases under this particular logical server. So just realize that construct is there when I think about, hey, these various options. Because it's gonna come into play when we think about our disaster recovery. And that disaster recovery is now what I wanna think about. So as we discussed, for disaster recovery, I wanna be in another region. And I want that other region to be hundreds of miles apart. I want a big, a big gap. Because remember, the high availability solution, especially with our availability zones, it gave us protection from even a data center, a building, a power substation level failure. But now we're talking about saying that impacted the entire region, uh, for example, a major natural disaster, in which case my DR shouldn't be just up the road from it. I want a very significant geographical distance to make sure whatever the problem is that hurt this, uh, doesn't hurt this as well. So hundreds of miles, Hundreds of miles means tens of milliseconds of latency. latency. And we can see this if we actually go and look, for example, at some of our statistics. Now this is around network latency in Azure between the different regions. But let's just pick, so what we're looking at here is West US to another region. So if I said West US to East US, which would be a, a good pairing here, well, I'd say it's 64 milliseconds. Now, to you and me, that, that seems really quick. 64 milliseconds, not a big deal. But that's very different than the latency I would have seen within the region, which again, we said was a maximum of two, but more likely it was like one millisecond. If I tried to durably store those operations from the client to a DR, which is what we're now talking about, over here, and I went from one millisecond to 60 milliseconds to do that, typically it will destroy the client application. And you might say, why? 60 milliseconds is not that much. But realize many times a business transaction is not one single SQL statement. It may be tens of them. Hey, it goes and looks something up. Or, okay, it looks something else up based on that. It can be very, very chatty because why wouldn't it be? It's used to the idea that the app is co-located with the database. We have this super low latency. I, I can take 10, 20 round trips to do my overall business transaction because it's, it's really zero cost to me. Hey, if I'm standing in the kitchen making a sandwich, I'm next to the fridge, I'll open the fridge up, get the butter out, close it, and then I'll go and get cheese and ham, whatever I might do. I can be wasteful because I'm very close to it. If I was going on a picnic, I'd have to make sure I packed all those things up front and took them all with me. Going back and forth to the fridge when I'm miles away, that would be a really miserable sandwich. And so hundreds, so it's a potential milliseconds if you add up those transactions means I cannot do synchronous replication anymore. I cannot durably store it over here, wait for that acknowledgement, store it here and then send it to the client. What it's gonna mean I'm doing is async. It has to be async replication. Async replication means when the client makes that request to me, hey, I durably store it here twice, through storage or through the always on, then I acknowledge that transaction to the client. And then as quick as I can, then I'll go and durably store it over here. But there's a definite lag to that. The client thinks it's durably stored and it is durably stored within the region, zero data loss, and then it gets sent to the other region. 
So that asynchronous nature starts to introduce the concept of potential data loss in unplanned situations. Um, it's also why if we ever have the idea of active-active applications in multiple regions, it's very common you'll add a read replica of the database in the other region as well. So the app can read, and normally reads a 90, 95% of the interactions of a database. And only if it had to write, would it then send the write over here. And it would take that latency. But I would think about, I'd optimize my code. I would maybe bundle different transactions together to minimize that latency hit. Also remember if I'm using things like private endpoints, network controls, firewalls, hey, I need to make sure I think about that in my DR option as well. Now what are my DR options for Azure SQL Database? And it's really two. Um, there's two options available to me. And it's why I drew out this structure. My first option is I want you to kind of ignore part of the name. I'll say the name, but I want you to ignore part of it. So the first is an automatic failover group. So I have the concept of an automatic failover group. So some attributes of this. This is set at a database server level. That's where I configure it. Now I can use this for both SQL Database and MI. So this is, can be used by both of them. Now if I'm using SQL Database, I can select which databases I want to be part of an automatic failover group. It also means I could have multiple failover groups, um, but a database can only be in one of them. With SQL MI, it's all of them. So hey, I enable automatic failover group, it will be all of the databases in that failover group. So there's a, there's a difference there. With this, there is only one replica. So there will be one replica, and it has to be a different region. Because this is a, it's a DR solution. Now, one of the really nice things though this solution offers me is this automatic failover group adds listener. And it's actually two. There's a read write listener and a read listener. And this will just update for me. So if I was to change over which one is the primary, this will be updated. So my client doesn't have to make any changes at all. It's a really nice option. Now my other technology I can leverage is I have this concept of just geo-replication. Now with geo-replication, it is set at a database level, not the server. Now, the, the cool thing about the geo-replication, though, is I can have up to four replicas. So I have a lot more flexibility, and it could be in the same or different region. But this option is only for database, not managed instance. I would also be responsible for client redirection. There is no nice listener pointing to this. So if I was to do a failover, I would have to be managing my own way to either having my own DNS alias that I manage, or the client would have to go and update to leverage this. This replication is built on availability group um, streaming changes of the transaction logs. So it, it's a common technology. So what's actually happening behind the scenes here for this, whatever one of these you pick, is it's doing the log shipping. So I can think about the logs. Are being sent. And it's the same technology for either one. What's really happening here, when you look at those automatic failover groups, it's really an abstraction over geo-replication. It's just grouping them all together. 
you can actually see it. So if we was to jump back over for a second. So this is, remember, my SQL Server. And I can go and look at my failover groups, and I've created one. Now, once again, you have this horrible automatic thing, which I'm going to try and erase from your brain. But I can look at it, and I can see, yep, I have my secondary. There it is over there. It has its own special listeners. So I have both the read-write listener, and then I have a read-only. And the key point here is you'll notice it adds the dot secondary as part of that fully qualified domain name. But within this, if I actually go back a second, I can see the primary and the secondary servers. But if I was to then go and look at the actual databases that make this up, and I was to go and look at its replicas configuration, it still has geo-replication configured. It just went and did it for me. So that failover group is an abstraction of the geo replicas. But it's giving me those other functionalities. It lets me fail over an entire group of databases for me. I don't have to manually go and do it one by one. So that, that's really the important point of that abstraction. So it, it's the same technology. Now, one thing I, I really do want to, I guess, stress um, when I think about this is that term automatic, because it's horrible. Mainly because you saw that 60 minutes. And so people see 60 minutes for the fail open like this is useless. Uh, I don't want a 60 minute timer. So yes, there does have this word automatic in the name. But we're going to kind of forget about that. Because although it says the 60 minutes, we can go and look at this. Let's go back to the actual server again. And we have that failover group. I can go and look at it. I can edit the configuration. That automatic, I can turn off if I want to. And so just manual. So I would manually fail over. Even if I leave automatic turned on, I can still do a manual failover. And people get confused because this one hour is the smallest time you can possibly do, which is like, well, in a DR, I don't want to wait an hour. Why would I possibly want to wait an hour? That's completely horrible. And it's absolutely true. It is completely horrible. That 60 minutes would be Microsoft choosing to fail over your database for you in some kind of huge regional problem. And it's 60 minutes because they want a long grace period to make sure there really is some huge issue that can't be resolved because they're failing everyone over. And there's a potential for data loss there. And so they have this very, very large catch-all scenario. You would not use that. You are going to manually fail over um, for multiple reasons. And I'm going to go into a lot of detail on this. Um, but realistically, when we think of DR then, we're using this log shipping. So what would our DR recovery point objective, i.e. what's the amount of data we may lose in an unplanned scenario, and what is our recovery time objective? How quickly can we be up and running? So this log shipping is really as quick as it possibly can. Now, one of the important things we have to make sure is our DR configuration is sized as production. Because what happens is, remember, there's transactions being written to the primary. It's shipping them over. And then this has to replay them. So from a compute performance perspective, it has to be able to keep up. If it can't keep up, well, it will start to fall behind applying the logs, which means that gap is going to get bigger and bigger, i.e. potential data loss. And at a certain point, if it gets too big, the primary will actually start throttling. It will throttle the client operations to allow this to try and catch up. It won't let it get too far. So it will then actually impact the performance of the primary. So I'm paying for bigger, more powerful SQL here. But if this is tiny because I'm trying to save money on my DR and I'm like, oh, I'll make it bigger in the event of a DR, 
well, it's actually going to start negatively impacting the performance of this. So I'm not even getting the performance I'm paying for. So I need to size it as production. Maybe, I mean, really, you just need to. If you're going to fail over, hey, it needs to be able to meet the performance of the requirements. If it is sized as production and it keeps up with the log shipping, really, it should only ever be one or two seconds behind. So my recovery point objective is maybe one to two seconds. I mean, approximately. The recovery time objective, I think the worst case is 60 seconds. Now that is from the time I click the button and I say, hey, I want to do a failover. So, and when you do fail over, the whole point of this, the relational database management system will ensure it's in a clean state. I, hey, I failed over, it's not like the, the database or the logs are in a dirty state and it has to go through a cleanup. It will be ready to be activated and start without any delay. And we can see these um, recovery point objectives, recovery time objectives in the documentation. So if we scroll, manual failover, it talks about an RTO of 30, so it's even lower than what I'm saying. It says five seconds. I mean, that's, I guess, what the official one it's stating. Typically, it's one to two seconds. Sometimes it could even be less. Um, I've had customers that talk about, with, it's basically zero data loss. Um, it's really as, as close as it can be. And I guess while I'm in here, let's actually go and jump back over again. So notice, let's actually do a failover. Now, before the failover, we have this read, write, listener endpoint. And if we just go and look that up, we can see, well, here is that name. And what it's resolving to is that primary database that then jumps through another bunch of hoops until it actually gets to an IP we talk to. So it's DB server. If I now trigger a failover, I'm not gonna count seconds, but it, it's triggering the failover right now. So what it will do, now this is planned. Now remember, when I'm thinking about a planned scenario, it will be zero data loss. Because in a planned failover, what it's absolutely doing is it stops accepting changes on the primary it syncs the remaining logs and then switches over. So even in a DR, in a planned scenario, I won't lose any data. So if we go and look where we are right now, so it's completed, so that was sub-minute. So I can see we now have the primary is now DB server two. The secondary switch so switches them. So now it's reversed the replication so now what was the primary is now getting the replication. And now if I go back and look at that listener that the failover group provides for me, it's switched. So now it's pointing to Savile DB Server 2. So my client would have that retry logic built into it. Yes, it would have seen an interruption. Remember I said it should reestablish a new session, not just try and reissue the command against the old session. Make sure I'm not doing something abnormal in the actual client application. And what I mean by abnormal is I'm not trying to skip a step with the DNS. That when it starts up, I look it up and then I store what it resolves to underneath. Because then if it has to do a failover, HA or DR, it's gonna be pointing to the wrong one. You'd have to restart the app. So make sure you're not trying to shortcut because you think you're being hey, I'm gonna save some DNS lookup time by doing it at the start and caching it, but well, it will break any HADR that the database may be doing. And let the client do the retry. And I'm actually gonna come back to that listener and some of the DNS settings and why they are what they are. But the whole point here is when I think about disaster recovery, we really have this concept of both planned and, <coughs> excuse me, unplanned. Now, people sometimes say planned is only for testing purposes. I disagree with that completely. Their logic is that in a real disaster, it can only be unplanned. I didn't see it coming. 
most natural events, there is some indication, hey, a storm is coming. Remember, unplanned is basically where'd my data center go? I had no warning at all that a problem was coming. Planned is like, oh look, there's a big storm. Unplanned, why is there a hole in the ground? And so in a planned scenario, remember, there will be no data loss. That, that's the key point. Because it stops the operations, it sends over the remaining transaction logs, they get played in, then it reverses. I won't lose anything. It's only in the unplanned scenario, well, that's where that recovery point objective, and I may lose that one to two seconds based on whatever that lag was. Yes, I will lose that and I will lose it for good. There is no way to later on replay those transaction logs in, they are gone. Now, potentially, maybe the client can replay the transactions in the event of a disaster recovery. If I really cannot afford any data loss, even in a disaster recovery unplanned, which is super rare, super unlikely, I need to look at other options. Um, Cosmos DB, for example, can do strong consistency. It will make sure it is durably stored. <clears throat> but I really have to think about my application has to be written intelligently to start bundling and being very efficient with those rights to accept because strong, strong consistency doesn't magically make the delay, the latency go away. I, I still got to get that latency. I just have to now accept it. So if I really do have zero data loss in an unplanned disaster, I probably have to change my application architecture. And many times a customer will initially say, I can't afford any data loss, even in a disaster. When you start to talk about what would be required of that, most of the times when you say, well, it might be a couple of seconds, realistically, this is a, a huge bad event to have an unplanned DR. And it's such an unlikely scenario and it, because it would be such a major impact, normally one or two seconds actually is acceptable to organizations. And even some of them have five minute RPOs. It, it really varies by industry. But if you really are in a zero data loss unplanned DR, I have to think about other ways to ensure data is durably stored, which can absolutely be done but my application has to be at a tolerant of that latency. So it's just important to understand that. The next thing that always comes up is that word automatic. And I drew a line for it, oops. And I drew a line for it and I was like, no, we don't want automatic. In my experience, as an organization thinks about the failover scenario, no one wants it to be automatic. Things happen. Uh, there are transient problems. And if you had automatic failover, what if it failed over incorrectly? It misunderstood. And maybe I've introduced now a data loss where I didn't need to have it. Also remember, your failover is not just your database. Very likely if you fail over, if I'm not running active active and I'm not, not using those listeners, hey, the app has to be started, the app has to be failed over, resources may need to be created. There's a whole set of actions that have to go on. And so what we really want is this idea that there is a human involved. There's a human involved, but what they should have is this nice kind of easy button that they can push that then does everything. So hey, I push the button, maybe it's firing off some automation, some scripting, and it then does everything. If it's a true disaster, I don't want some poor human being that may be worried about their families having to read through a 40 page doc to do the failover. I want the actual process, once the human decides I want to fail over, to just happen and happen in the right sequence of things that have to happen, the right checks. But what's absolutely critical for this to work is we need very, very strong monitoring because they need the signals, they need the right signals, the right information to tell them. So I'm gonna have, for example, dashboards, there's gonna be instrumentation, 
to let them know there's going to be alerts firing that tells them, oh, oh, there's a disaster. We need to recommend fouling over. And when I talk about monitoring, I'm not just talking about the resources. Yes, I want to monitor the actual resource, but I also want to make sure the application is being monitored. And by that, I mean, well, hey, I'm creating this idea of synthetic transactions that are firing inside the network, outside the network, around the world, and am I getting the right response back from the app? I need all of the different types of information, service health, um, metrics, is it falling outside of a normal app insights, synthetic transactions, I need all of these signals to tell me is the complete service healthy? Because the resource may be fine, but there's some combination of factors on different things working together that has made the app unhealthy. So I need all of these feeding in, letting me know. And I need to make sure that the, the operations team are empowered to do the failover. They have confidence that that failover is gonna work. So what that means is to get that confidence, so I, I need to have that, I need to be testing this very frequently. I know many customers that will actually perform this maybe every three months. And it's not a test, they will switch, which is the primary region. What gives you better confidence than, hey, every three months I switch them? I would really not have any significant concern as an operations person doing that failover if there were signs telling me there was a problem if I knew, yeah, we, we fell over every three months, we do it all the time, we have great processes. Compared to, we have a DR, we really hope we never have to use it, because, well, I don't know, may work, may not, I don't want to click that button. That delay in clicking the button causes you now impact to your business. So you want to make sure you give your operations team that empowerment to be willing to activate it, because you're very confident. So confident is everything. I have to feel very secure, so I'm very happy, I don't know if I'd be smiling in a DR scenario, but I wouldn't be afraid to activate it. I've built up the confidence because we do this periodically, we know it's gonna be good. And obviously after you fail over, you then validate. You have a set of steps that the app team would go through to validate the failover was successful. Hey. Now we're willing, we're, we're up and running. The only other thing I wanted to talk about was that listener. Now, I did show the listener, and I, I kind of showed it when we looked at the DNS name. But remember, the whole point is the failover group, the fantastic thing that's happening is I don't connect to a database server. What I'm actually connecting to here is this idea of the listener. which is a fully qualified domain name, which that is what actually goes and points to the gateway, which then may either redirect me to the actual database server, or it may uh, actually proxy it on my behalf. It depends if I'm accessing it typically from inside a private endpoint or a public endpoint, an internal endpoint versus a public endpoint but that avoids me as the app having to change anything. I just have this quality retry logic in place. It will handle everything for me. And we saw exactly that. So if we go back and look at the output we got again, remember initially what it was resolving to, go up, there we go, up the top. Initially what it resolved to was Savile DB server. Now what I want you to actually pay attention to is we had this time to live of 30 seconds. So that listener name, the client caches it for 30 seconds. So realistically, worst case, it should be 30 seconds before we'll go and check that entry again. Now you notice some of them are longer until you get to ones that actually then point to uh, 
which actual server in the back end of Azure, and that's only a 10 second time to live. So things that won't change often have longer time to lives. Things that might change quicker have much shorter times to lives. And so that listener endpoint is 30 seconds. So it could take up to 30 seconds to see it a changed anyway. And that's why it's important we don't try and cache things internally in our application. We don't mess with the operating system that's doing that logic. It has to be the one to go and see that, oh, it's changed, I'll do a new session and then carry on doing whatever I was doing. Remember, if I was just using that Geo Replica, it doesn't give me the listener. I would have to build something into my client or my own DNS name to handle that. But this is all just done for me with those automatic um, failover groups. Again, the word automatic, yuck. We just call it failover groups because we're gonna manually do the failover. Um, my app doesn't have to change anything. The listener is provided for me. It will get updated. You may wonder, why is it 30 seconds? Why don't we do it for a second? There's a balance. If that time to live is too small, then I'm constantly having to go and do a DNS request, and which takes time. If I have to every second go and look up DNS, well, that's gonna slow down every second that transaction that hits it as it goes and does the DNS lookup. But then if it's too long, I don't respond quick enough to the change, I'll still be pointing to the old one, which is why if we think about, well, the recovery time objective, let's say is 60, but they wrote 30, remember, in the documentation. Well, if we can fail over within 30 seconds, having a time to live of 30 seconds makes complete sense. Because in a worst case, I'm gonna see the new one within 30 seconds. So that's why it's set at that value. Any smaller, I'm doing unnecessary DNS lookups, NS lookups all the time, it, it wouldn't have changed anything. It takes longer than that, and I'm slowing down my regular operations. Longer than the recovery time objective, well, it's failed over, but I've still cached the old value, and I'm pointing to the wrong one. So having that as 30 seconds is an optimal time to not waste lookups, but also I will see it when it has actually changed. So that's, that's why it's doing it that way. And that was it. So that was really my whole goal of this session to go through kind of what those options are. Really, I think the key takeaway is never get confused about this automatic and the 60 minute thing. You're not gonna do it. Realistically, the recovery point objective is a couple of seconds. My recovery time, hey, it wrote 30 seconds in a documentation. So it's really not, once I click that button, you saw it, fails over very, very quickly. I don't want the system to automatically do it anyway because there might be bad signals that confuse it. What I wanna do is empower my operations team to get all the right alerting and dashboards so they get told very quickly when the app is impacted. They have strong confidence in the failover because we test it thoroughly. Maybe we switch every three months so we know it's good. So they feel confident clicking it and then it's all scripted, automated, so they're not having to go through 30 pages of failover documentation. The failover group is fantastic because it gives me this nice listener, so my client doesn't have to change, but make sure you have quality retry logic in the client that does that exponential back off, make sure it is establishing a new session, and then, hey, it will go and see when it's failed over in a very timely way. You do think HA and DR, so within the region, Availability zones give me very strong resiliency from most blast radiuses with zero data loss planned or unplanned. And it's only in a unplanned, which is very unlikely, DR scenario, I may lose that couple of seconds of data. You have backups as well, um, which is useful for other scenarios, I need to go back in time, etc. So I hope that was useful. As always, till next video, take care.